uh, no, we are uh, now delayed 10, 11 minutes and you should start. I think it's uh, Professor Tom Onel who will chairing the next session and he is uh, with us. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, uh, Professor Tom. Professor Tom. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Yes. Hi. How are you, Professor Tom? Good, good. So I guess, Dan, you are our first speaker. So I will uh, let you take over there and, uh, and uh, we'll all give up a minute or two to try to get us back on track, but uh, we'll see how that goes. All right. I'll, I can keep my comments very short. I'm, I'm kind of a high level presenter. And so I and uh, I kept my slides short as well. So normally I'm the type that has 30 or 40 slides. I kept it to 10 or less. So uh, let's see if I can. Um, I only have I, 70 slides, so it would be fine for me. <laughs> there we go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to read them. Um, and I do uh, I, I do have a link that I'm willing to share in the um, uh, the chat box if it makes it easier for people to get a hold of these slides. All right. So let me see if I can share this. All right. Great. Can everyone see that okay? Oh, yeah. it's good. Okay, great. Everyone can see it but me. There we go. So um, so good morning and, and again, thank you or good afternoon and good evening for everyone else. Um, uh, my name is Dan Ripke. I'm the, the Executive Director for the Educational Association of University Centers. I've been involved in economic development from a university standpoint for about 35 years. Uh, been the pleasure to work with folks like Dr. Morrison and others um, around the country. So most of my experience, I will say, is from North America. Um, working in Canada and the United States with universities, both small and large, um, which is why I, I say one size does not fit all. Right now, I'm I'm located in Monterey Bay, which is you know 45 minutes away from Stanford University in the Silicon Valley. Uh, that being said, most of the universities I've worked with over the last 35 years have been small universities, working in communities of about you know maybe 300 to 3,000 people. So, and by that I mean um, they don't all have their university resources of a Stanford or UC Berkeley or Harvard, et cetera. So um, uh, let me make sure I'm, there we go. So basically I'll talk about the, the models of support in terms of universities and what they've been doing since the 1970s, how to best align universities to serve the needs of the local region. Um, and then I'll give some specific examples of the program that developed in the United States and has been evolving which has been the EDA University Center, the Economic Development Administration University Center program. So, um, so the the, the uh, and Ed might remember this program since I think you were involved in the early days. Uh, nationally in, in the United States, there was an association called the National Association of Management Technical Assistance Centers. This was about 350 universities around the country that were uh, everything in scale from large scale universities like a Stanford or a Harvard or Purdue all the way down to smaller universities like the one I was at, which uh, had a total enrollment of about maybe 10,000 people. Uh, but these are communities, or excuse me, universities that serve the local region. So these are universities that are, might have a population base anywhere from two or 300,000 up to maybe 2 million. Um, so these are universities that are trying to do um, serve the local region. When we typically think of university economic development, we think of a basic research institution. We think of an, an R1 that's conducting research for either the private sector or for, for defense contractors or doing some sort of research in biotech. Um, that's one form of economic development, and that is obviously where much of the research dollars are spent. However, there are small universities that are doing excellent work in more of the sphere of what we describe as community research or community economic development. Um, typically very small, um, more and more they're not in the technical fields of sciences, maybe in the more social sciences fields, um, and then trying to um, work with issues around, say, for example, lack of workforce, commute patterns, being able to, to uh, draw the research from urban areas like the Silicon Valley into a, a rural area, which in my case in Northern California is located six hours north of San Francisco. So it's it's spatially isolated parts of the country. Um, so in the United States, the, the federal government came up with a variety of programs to help address these areas in between. Uh, one of the first programs that ever developed was through the US Department of Agriculture and the um, 
uh, Rural Development Administration. These programs are very small. They typically help farmers develop new products. In other cases, it's it's simply getting money in to help rural school, schools and rural communities stay afloat. Um, the Small Business Administration came in with programs, uh, again, often or most often based at universities. Uh, one of those programs is called the Small Business Development Center, which are uh, sets of offices that provide no cost business advising and counseling to small businesses to help them launch and grow. Uh, again, most of the small business development centers in the country that I've worked with and I've, I've managed uh, the SVDCs in California for about 13 years. Um, these programs are based at universities and leverage universities and college faculty when and where appropriate. So it's an excellent leveraging resources. And I mentioned also that there are other programs within the Small Business Administration. Um, in particular, there's something called the, the Women's Business Centers, there's the Veteran Business Outreach Centers, and there's also Procurement Technical Assistance Centers as well. So uh, HUD or the Housing and Urban Development Administration created a Community Resilience Program, which would get into a program to help rural communities that were distressed. Um, much of it dealing with um, economic distress due to the high unemployment and low per capita income. And finally, last but not least, in the program that, that I'm most familiar with is the Economic Development Administration. They launched a program in the 70s and 80s that has since grown and has done really well, which is the EDA University Center Program, which has centers around the country, typically one to three per state, depending on the size of the state. And it's not a huge amount of money. We're only talking about 150,000 maybe per, per university. And then the university matches it on an equal share and that creates about a $300,000 program. Those programs very often act as a portal to help the private sector and the public sector access the university resources. So you can think of it as a nexus point to help people in the community be able to access faculty and others at the university. So um, the NAMTEC, the association I mentioned earlier, it evolved to become the University Economic Development Association, as well as the uh, EAUC, the Educational Association of University Centers. They partnered with the APLU, the um, uh, uh, Associated Land Grant Universities, to um, create a program. Oops. Um, or excuse me, to create a model looking at air economic development at universities or a paradigm. And so that paradigm looked at three different sections or areas. One is talent, the other is innovation, and one is played. So the talent, typically from a university standpoint, looks at the human capital and the talent that we develop. Uh, the the uh, innovation looks at research and what we do in terms of developing new products, new services, and the entrepreneurship that is needed to help <laughs> make those uh, ventures profitable. And then finally, last but not least, is the third aspect of the paradigm, which is the community stewardship. And that is the linking of the university to the place. And so it's that paradigm that the the UEDA looked at and has been focused on. And that model, I know it probably doesn't come across well here, but when you think about these three um, overlapping Venn diagram of innovation, talent, and place, while it appears like there are only three of them, they're actually seven different areas and that's created by the overlapping of things like the talent and innovation here the innovation in place and the um talent in, in place and then finally the the overlapping of all three of these the reason why i bring this up is traditionally when we go into a community and and try to align a university or help the university to identify ways that they can engage on a local community basis we typically try to help them to find ways in which their existing program fall within these these uh, seven areas. So um, I'm out of time. So I want to make sure that I just really quickly, briefly um, touch on the University Center program in a little more detail. It's basically a technical assistance program funded by the federal government and Department of Commerce. It's on a five-year competitive cycle. So uh, those in the United States that hear about this program, it is something that you can uh, compete with on a five-year basis. Uh, with renewing grants um, and it provides an excellent opportunity for your university to get involved. Um, I did mention that there are already existing university centers around the country and so if you are in a rural area um, I highly encourage you to partner with uh, some of these programs that might be a great way for you to get more involved in economic development and I thank you very much. All right, thank you Dan. Um, I think our next speaker is I see him here so Sabi. I said that right. You are next. 
So you oh, release yes. the I don't know if you can see me. There we go. How are you, sir? Um, very well. Thank can you see me? Can you hear me? I can. Um, Thank you. Dan, if you release control of the um let's see here. Let me see. I can't share my screen. Can you is my control release jet? Okay. I don't think so. Oh. Uh, you have on. a beautiful background. There we go. <laughs> there we there we go. go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, let's see if I can make it to work in presentation mode. Just bear with me a second, please. Perfect. Perfect. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Sabi Kisaf. I have two hats for today's session. The I work for Hyperloop Transportation Technology as uh, infrastructure lead for the MENA region. My background is civil infrastructure, but I'm also the institution of civil engineers, vice presidents for international and the UAE uh, local committee chair. Today, I will be very briefly on uh, how the uh, new technology, the Hyperloop, going to uh, change the way we travel and uh, we, uh, how we, this technology going to change the environment as well. Uh, the Hyperloop is a breakthrough in transportation. It will define the uh, distances. For those who don't uh, know much about the Hyperloop, we, envisage uh, 1200 kilometers an hour uh, speed inside a vacuum tube. It's also profitable. As we know, the Hyperloop uh, transportation is it's going to be unsubsidized transport system. Uh, no transport system around the globe is profitable and the Hyperloop is going to be one of them. It also will reduce the operational cost. And the reason for that, because we don't have many uh, uh, components as uh, uh, other transport systems. Uh, the whole system is automated. And that's reduced the uh, um, causes of uh, interference from outside. Uh, it's used the latest innovation in safety and also um, uh, could be ensured. One of the biggest problems for any transportation system or any infrastructure project is uh, insurance. And the uh, system can be insured by uh, and the, uh, the Munich Re published latest paper on the insurance for the, for the technology is sustainable, reduce pollution and use renewable um, uh, energy. Uh, basically the system use less energy than it's uh, produced. And uh, we've done a, a paper for Canada and basically it says that even in Canada, we can't generate 15% more electricity than we need to operate the system. And it's built on future technology. Very briefly about the system is uh, a capsule. It's basically an airplane with no wings inside a vacuum tube. And the reason for the vacuum is to reduce the friction with the air, with the air and the capsule. It's also um, levitate and levitation uh, give us the opportunity to reduce the friction between the uh, wheel and the truck. And it's fully enclosed in the uh, uh, in its environment, and therefore, as we said earlier, it reduces the potential of any accidents or outside interference. And it the, uses alternative energy and uh, uh, basically reducing the uh, uh, use of electricity uh, uh, from the grid. We give more to the grid uh, than we take. It's, as we know, the first um, industrial revolution back in England with the uh, mechanical and uh, uh, water, water steam uh, engine. Then we have Detroit and the Silicon Valley. And that we believe that the Hyperloop is going to be the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, we discussed earlier about certification because you know no system cannot, can be in, implemented or uh, built without certification and We've been working with TUV SAD on the certification, and recently we uh, submitted to 
European Union, their first set of certification. We discuss the insurance, the system and the technology can be insured and therefore one big hurdle is uh, can uh, be eliminated. It's immune to weather. Passive magnetic levitation, the, uh, this technology is developed by Lawrence Livermore uh, Labs and it's allow us to uh, levitate and propel without uh, uh, using uh, wheels. And uh, there is no need uh, for crossing with traffics. And uh, we all know within the transportation uh, technology that uh, more than 70% of accidents, it's either uh, outside intervention or impact from uh, um, trucks, cars, and uh, most recently, um, two years ago, when India opened its first high-speed uh, train, it, the system has to be shut down. They, after it's opened, because there were some cows on on the line. The same thing happened in England, in south of England. They have to close the station because the station was uh, invaded by cows, and therefore, for us, this is not a problem. Um, we also use smart center sensors. These smart sensors can be used for the tube and for the capsule. And basically the capsules can uh, communicate between each other, front and back, and also with the uh, uh, communication and uh, operation center. It's quiet. And for those who, of us who live next to a railway line, we know the, the noises or highway uh, causes by the, the traffic and with the hyperloop because it's inside uh, uh, a protected environment and there is uh, no noise and it's electric therefore no pollution. Um, the, the technology has as a technology involved a number of uh, you know industries from aerospace, aeronautics, advanced materials and the advanced material basically we envisage to use composite materials for the capsule and for the tube. As the beginning we envisage a, a steel tube but we also working on a technology where composite materials would be used for the tube and the other component. We mentioned early green technology on the solar uh, panels. Uh, what is envisaged basically the, the tube both tube, the up and down would be covered by solar panel and this solar panel will generate uh, the electricity required and what is extra will be uh, uh, put back into the grid. We'll be using artificial intelligence, 3D printing and also magnetics uh, levitation. The passenger experience, as we said, um, it's like an airplane and the, the technology is going to be inclusive for everyone we don't have different classes. It's one class for uh, all users. And uh, the impact of uh, uh, the technology on real estate, I am based in, in Dubai. And when the uh, Dubai municipality uh, built the Dubai Metro, all uh, assets around the uh, alignment in, as value uh, and as uh, rent increased by uh, 20%. And therefore, the uh, hyperloop is invited to increase above uh, 20%. Um, where we are uh, with the technology and how we're going to uh, implement it and the way we, our vision to implement the technology, it's always whenever we've been working on feasibility studies and you can see on, uh, on the screen the number of feasibility studies we've done around the globe. And the first feasibility study we've done is between Abu Dhabi and Ain here in, in the UAE. And then we uh, done uh, one in, uh, in India and the, the Great Lake High Pool Feasibility Study in the US in, in, in cooperation with the Department for Transport. And also we work on, uh, on a feasibility study for uh, freight in Brazil. And we always, whenever we uh, envisage or uh, initiate a project, we do the feasibility study. The feasibility study will give us the uh, op option of studying the capital cost, operational cost, and uh, the impact of uh, implementing the technology for uh, the, the country where it's going to be implemented. 
And we envisage to implement the technology working with the local uh, partners, including you know, uh, contributors and uh, companies. And I would explain at the, at the end what's mean by contributors. Um, the, at, at the moment, uh, as a Hyperloop TT, we are the first company who implemented a full-scale uh, prototype. This is located in Toulouse, and we have research and development center in collaboration with the French government. And basically what we're doing there, we implemented a full-scale uh, 320 meters, uh, four meter diameter tube to, uh, to implement and test the component of the technology and to try to carry out uh, levitation and propulsion. And uh, also we have the full scale of uh, pumps and you can see in the pictures, the set of pumps and the, uh, the top uh, middle picture is, is the uh, US the Department of Transport visiting the facilities in Toulouse. And all this is in collaboration with the French government and everything is uh, full scale. Another picture of, of the full scale tube and you can see uh, the way it's been built and the support structure. But also um, not just the, the, the tube, but we built two full scale capsules. One of these capsules already been shipped to Toulouse and at the moment we're working to introduce the, the capsule inside the tube and do some uh, levitation and proportion test. And all this built in the in collaboration with our partners around the globe. Um, the, the way we, we want to implement the, the technology, uh, it's first to implement a research and development and demonstration sector. And this is a typical uh, concept uh, designed for the uh, research and development and visitor center. We propose to be uh, implemented in Abu Dhabi. We signed an agreement with Aldar in Abu Dhabi. The, the Aldar is the biggest uh, property developer in UAE. And they, they uh, gave us land to implement uh, um, research and development and visitor center. And this is the concept of how the research and development center would look like. Again, 3D uh, vision of the station. And we envisage one side of the, the demonstration truck, a station with the re, a visitor center. On the other side is research and development center where we can work with our partners uh, to develop the technology. And this concept could be impl implemented uh, uh, anywhere around the globe. And we've been discussing with different governments to implement. We have, uh, you know, advanced agreement in Europe, Americas, and the Middle East. Um, very quickly on how a capsule look like. This is a concept of a Hyperloop capsule, and it shows the uh, how the capsule is designed as typical an airplane. Another view of of the capsule. Not going to get into too much details. It's very obvious how a capsule look like, and this is plan view of a, a capsule uh, hyperloop. Um, we not working for passenger, but it's the the passenger experience is um, uh, it's the most you know desirable at this stage. But we also working with the humble port on a concept of cargo as well. And um, here you can see the, how the, the, the cargo looks like. I'm not going to read what's on, on the screen. The problem with the, uh, with the, the cargo uh, around the globe, uh, cost uh, delays, uh, uh, shortage of labor, but the Hyperloop will resolve it. And this is, as I said, it's a joint uh, venture with the humble port and basically the concept is <coughs> to build a, a, a onshore uh, port and like try a port and you transport the uh, the the container directly on the hyperloop uh, capsule and 
your operation instead of next to uh, the dock is going to be done anywhere. Very briefly, uh, how uh, this looks like, unconsciously sometimes for questions, but I'm more, ha more than happy to uh, stay in touch. And if you have any, any questions, uh, even after we finish this presentation, I'm more than happy to answer and provide uh, uh, more details. Um, uh, very quickly on uh, how uh, the, uh, the Hyperloop TT uh, as a company work. We are the first and the only company who work on crowdsourcing. And basically the, the company um, work, we have uh, the uh, permanent staff and a small number up to 50 people, but we have contributors around the globe, more than 800. And the way we work basically Whenever we have uh, uh, any issue, any design issue, any uh, commercial issue or anything related to the technology, we have contributors and we designate a contributor to uh, do the, the work. And once the work is, is done, submitted his timesheet, her timesheet, and they get shared in the company. The same apply with the uh, companies as well. And we signed a number of agreements with consultant contractors and technology providers. And basically they, they sign and they dedicate uh, time uh, or uh, financial uh, investment in the company, they, they get share in the company. And uh, very recently, uh, Harvard Business School um, uh, basically uh, uh, stated that we are the pioneers in uh, crowdsourcing technology. Um, and to conclude, it's basically we innovate on for productivity and we are accountable to, on the work we're doing. And we also engage, engage with our partners, engage with our contributors. And as I said, the company is the first collaboration and contribution company in the world. And with this, I conclude. And I'm conscious, I'm more than happy to ask questions. I think there is a, a question or a statement what that concept interesting. And I don't know how we're going to do if there is anyone who wants to ask questions, are we going to deal with it on the chat or in person? Thank you. We, yeah, you have a couple of minutes. So anybody would like to ask something in person, just unmute yourself and, and ask a very interesting concept. Um, Again, my first question is, uh, how did the how did you pull off the crowdfunding from such an enormous project? Yeah, basically, we, uh, as we said, we work uh, around the globe. And when we work with partners, seminars, or when uh, uh, people reach out, and it's on our website, if you Google hyperlooptt.com, there are all the details for uh, anyone can uh, participate, can contribute submit their CV, and we take it from there. Hmm. Any more uh, great, thanks, um, Mr. Sabih, for your participation. Uh, just we need to draw the attention for all. Uh, ICE is uh, uh, institutions of civil engineering as a leading institutions worldwide. Uh, they focusing in uh, smart cities and implementing the latest technology. Uh, and be also a uh, um, uh, member in ICE. ICE also it's a co-organizer for this conference. Uh, they joining with the high levels. Uh, tomorrow, the ICE president will be in the opening ceremony, Mr. Keith, and today the vice president, Mr. Sabih. And after a while, also there are many uh, charter engineers will be participating from the UK. And uh, great thanks, Mr. Sabih, for your uh, participations and for your presentations. And great thanks for all other speakers participate in our conference. And really, we're looking forward for more expansion for the next year. Thank you very much. Uh, good luck, everyone. And pleased to meet you and talk to you. All the best. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm more happy to provide more details. Take care, all the best.
Thank you. Okay, um, share my screen now. Um, I believe you see my, my, my image now. So I would like to spend my time talking about again, innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm a university person. Um, I think everybody probably knows that by now, but um, I kind of started my career as an entrepreneur, then I ended up going to college later. So I have a different perspective than, than most people uh, on the subject. I'm mostly considered a practitioner in the field. So with that said, um, I believe that universities have an enlightened self-interest to really help their communities grow and prosper through tech transfer and commercialization. Um, I believe more than ever that it's a, it's a way to attract you know, high talent and students and faculty to your university because most people understand this and want to be around it. They like the environment, they like the culture that goes along with these things. And um, it's just vital to all countries and you know, certainly particularly in the U.S., to maintain an edge on the ability to take brightest ideas you have and get them to market so the whole world can benefit from these ideas and, 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 and innovations. Else, you know, it just sits on the shelf and does nobody any good. So uh, it is really, and I say this to tech transfer professionals, really is about the impact you can make in your community and the outcomes you, you drive for society and really small part of that should be licensing income but you shouldn't that shouldn't be what drives your offices so i spent a lot of time getting people to see the bigger picture so today um just talk about innovation in the u.s um this is a an innovation continuum if you will on how things work um goes all the way from this notion of things being discovered um ideas going coming to people's head uh kind of spontaneous inventions being done by sometimes on deliberate acts, sometimes accidentally, and accidentally discovering great things, and then figure out what to do with it. You've had the discovery, um, then maybe doing some a little more research on it that we call the, the applied research, taking it out of someone's head or someone's um, lab book and putting it into something that may, might work a little more. And then the early stage development happens in the prototyping, the MEM DPs you have down here, and then the later stage, more commercial uh, activities we have for these different uh, products and ideas as they come out of, out of somebody's head in the laboratories and how you get all this stuff all the way to market and pre and production um as you can see there's a there's a big things get thinner in this middle part here when you're ready to do these late stage demonstrations and get some traction in the marketplace and get some investment um, we call that the gap uh, there's some seed funding that will do some of this stuff in the U.S., the SBR, STT is one of the, the best tools we have to um, move something to a, from an idea to a feasibility stage to maybe some kind of prototyping that someone can show somebody and show some potential to get it funded by the commercial market. Um, but it's tough. This one, uh, Cyclotron, is a really interesting thing with um, the Berkeley out there in California. Um, it covers a lot of space, which is, you know, wonderful. But um, it only takes on about 11 people a year. So um, while it's wonderful, um, you know, it doesn't address the problem at scale of getting things out of the lab and getting the attention and special things they need to actually make this thing happen. So and I thought I would normalize things. So in some countries dominate in the aggregate, if you will, about um, academic funding. But if you look at the average industry funding per academic researcher, um, Germany leads the world, U.S. is behind, and then China, South Korea, and stuff. But, but, you know, the point I would make is it's not a huge difference between the top uh, one, two, three, maybe six or seven. And But still, there's a lot of money that goes to a lot of countries on an academic research per person basis. And um, the cost of doing business, if you will, in the research lab is less than some of these countries that, that uh, where the average might be less. So there's a lot of potential for academic research to advance their trade and develop some good ideas and move forward with it. And, and what does that mean for society? And I generally speaking, I think there's a lot of potential out there that's unrealized and unmet that we can take advantage of. And this is what happened. This is the pipeline. This is the funnel. Lots and lots of research. If you look at the number of intellectual property disclosures, will patent disclosures um, that come out of these things, there's only about 320,000 per year. Um, that's the cost. The cost is pretty <laughs> high if you think about it, it could be better. Two and a half million dollars for disclosure of, of research funding. 
Um, about 55% of the disclosure will actually go forward with the patent application, so about 175. Then 40% uh, of those actually will become awarded. And the result of that is about 30, 337,000 active licenses and options and about 9,261 startups, about, <laughs> and lots of jobs, lots of stuff. You know, I mean, I, I look at this and I'm not sure everything here is realized because that if you look at two and a half or $809 billion of research resulting in 300,000 jobs, that wouldn't actually be a very good number uh, in terms of dollars per job. But I think there's a lot of uh, missing items in this thing on some additional research that needs to be done. And certainly everybody heard about the gap. Um, this is the valley, the valley of death. Uh, this is the article that came out. Lots of money in this end, getting the basic and into the applied research done. But after that, it, it falls off significantly. The money for here, the getting through this part is challenging for everybody um, to where it becomes a mainstream commercial product. And then venture capitalists and VCs and angels get involved more in that. And uh, large companies take it over to get it done and get it to market um, and make it available to citizens of the U.S. Here's a good book I recommend uh, that's been updated a little bit. Um, and it features these um, universities that do it quite well um, in terms of tech transfer and, and being a part of their community and making a difference in the world in terms of innovation and um, the role that universities play in this. And I think Lewis has actually speak, spoke at this conference before. So good guy, a good book. I highly recommend if you're looking to see what best practices are in these particular universities. we got a Florida one here. So, uh, and even it's, it's really getting down even to the life sciences, which is kind of late to the game. And they're coming out with different programs now to help commercialize uh, NIH funded projects, if you will. How do you get these things out of the lab, get them into, into use, uh, help improve, hoping to improve patient lives. And, and uh, you know, I think we all know with COVID how, how challenging it was to get this thing developed into the marketplace. Although they did, they did a remarkable job, I think, of doing that. So with that, this is the things they're trying to do. Um, and worldwide, there's a coalition, if you will, uh, an alliance of folks from all over the, the world that are really trying to make this stuff better as part of global trade and understanding and how to make a, a broad-based prosperity for everybody. And in my time, one of the things I do is try to mitigate the risk of doing these things. So if driving commercially is, is a U.S. imperative, I'm the principal investigator for a program called ICOR, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And it is, how do you get an NSF investment? And they, they got, um, I guess, a um, little criticism from Congress that gives them lots of money saying, well, they're investing a lot of money in basic research. And they really want to see the economic benefits from it. Benefits from it. So they developed a program. Here's that same pitch, the, the valley of death is here. We're going to call this the ditch of death, which is between maybe some very university driven stuff and get it to a small business. But, you know, the impact they felt was small. How would we make it larger? So the NSF came up with this program called i which is Innovation Corp. And uh, it's based on some stuff, a lean, lean startup practice developed by a, a, a couple people in California, uh, Steve Blank and uh, Jerry Ingalls and some other people that they had that were uh, David Reese that kind of put it and documented and made it into a nice program for the National Science Foundation. And it's a, it's a big program here, and it's really had some interesting effects. So one of the things you want to do is de-risk the return on investment. So when I say that, you know, this is the, the thing that would make you think about it. Um, you have these products and these solutions and product development, but um, the customer was really a, a second thought. You know, you, you spent 10 years in a lab developing, developing something. You really didn't know if it solved anybody's problem. And the reason that's a big problem for U.S. and a lot of startups is the number one reason company, company, <laughs> companies fail Sorry, I had some dental work. I can't speak today. But uh, one of the main reasons, well, the main reason that customers, the startups fail is they build things that nobody wants. They're just, you know, it's kind of overstatement, but they build something that a few people want that doesn't solve a problem at scale. It's a, we call it a mosquito bite instead of a, or an ant bite instead of a shark bite. And they're solving problems, but there's really not enough market share for that. Or maybe they're not solving anybody's problem except for their lab problem in the market stick. So, we're going to talk about just de-risking the customer. Uh, i course or UC Teams, we have a, a, a three-person team. One's the entrepreneurial lead that we work on them to do the actual customer discovery and research. Um, then there's a mentor, which we highly believe in um, in terms of getting these people on the right track and keep with a, with a person that's been there and done that. 
the principal investigator, usually the person that had come up with a discovery that I mentioned earlier, had the idea. And um, they're usually a part of this team. They go out and do customer discovery together. You take this idea, you put this funnel, and you put these three people together, and you figure out again what products, what services, what problems they solve, what features does they have to have, what cost points, um, the channels, how you get it to market, and what partners would they need to actually make this thing a real, a real deal. And then you have a viable business model. And then again, if you do that, how do you make money? So the big concept is we're going to lower the stuff. We use the scientific method to actually go out in the world and discover, um, is there a market for this thing? Is there people that need to buy it? Does it solve a big enough problem to create a company around? And um, this is what it works. We make people in, in a particular thing, go out and talk to 100 people over a seven-week period, find out what they do every day, find out what makes them happy, find out where their biggest problem is, we put them down to a set of hypotheses and they go out in the field and test these hypotheses to see if they're real or not real with the customer. The customer is where you get your data, like you would use any other, any kind of other discovery with the hypotheses and then develop a minimum solution for the customer. And if not, you know, pivot, go back and do something else or realize that there isn't really a big market. So you minimize the risk that people are going to take a chance with the startup. So we start off with the problem solution fit. Um, does this solution actually solve a problem that's in the in the real world? And then we come up with the product market fit. Is it scalable? Can it work for the for the masses? Does it really meet a need in the market, the bigger market at large? And if that gets past us, we use this thing called a business model canvas, which I'm going to be happy to explain to you there. And these two first boxes is again, what's the real value proposition that people have to solve for? And what customer segment does it work? But these nine boxes cover, cover everything from channels to revenue models and cost structures and partners and activities and the resources you need to get this thing out of, out of, out of someone's head into a, a less risky proposition for investors and, and the PI and the entrepreneur that want to start something like that. And like in this big question here is uh, lastly, we, we look at, you know, is the founder the right person? Is this idea or this thing they discovered in the lab something they're passionate enough about? to go all, do all of what it takes to get this thing to market. Do they really care about this project or are they just um, fuddling around? So, um, and uh, this is the network now, the National Innovation Network. So there's i -Corps sites in all these places. The blue ones are what we call hubs. They're actually going through a, a iteration of this right now uh, with, with the hub program instead of a, a, a node and a site. We're a site here so far. They have three sites. So as you can see, it's, it's proportion pretty good. There's some areas here that could be shored up, I think. But, um, and I say that because one of the things I did was figure out where all the jobs come from. And this is a heat map of the US and all the net new jobs created by new and growing small businesses. You can see it's really pretty uniformly distributed uh, the, with the, the people, with the, the known characters, you will, with the, with the hottest spots, but there's also spots all over the country that are, that are hot, that show up in red, it's creating lots of jobs for lots of people but mainly in the small and the growing small businesses. And I'll throw this out just for your, uh, your contemplation, this is something I did about 10 or 11 years ago. And I always felt being an entrepreneur and an innovator and, a, and an engineer, that the entrepreneur needs, needs to be in the center of any innovation system that you want to build for your community or, or your region and surround them with these things. You know, they need to be able to access the intellectual capital to these innovation people discoveries. They also need to have resources um, all the way from incubators, accelerators, banking, professional service providers. And your community needs to care about them and what they're trying to do. So these advocates and champions do that. They'll probably need some capital at some point. So access to resources and the talent, you know, not just the, the startup, not just the, the CEOs, but, you know, the people that do the come to every day to do the work. Uh, is it there? And if you do this well, they'll stay in your communities. Uh, most entrepreneurs do not need to want to move. They will if they have to be successful. So you want to build an innovation-based ecosystem for entrepreneurs so they can be successful in your community and thrive. And lastly, this is a, I'm a sailor, you can probably tell by my background. So I put together an analogy for what this journey looks like based on my um, 40 years of sailing experience. And, this is kind of what you do in the beginning. You have these people, a bunch of people with ideas. They're all kind of crazy all over the place. You got to manage these things. You got to get more people in the water, more crazy boats. But people that want to will take this chance. They'll go out and they'll be risky. 
and they're not coordinated or not working together. If you'll some of these pictures, you see they're actually rowing in two different directions. So, um, and some of these boats just don't float. Some of them don't get down to, down to the end of this, this river race, if you will. So the, there's places you can do that. You know, you can help them develop their NDPs. You can have these uh, maker spaces so they can build something to see this idea. And they can have just meeting for people to gather to share ideas and stuff. And the next area here is, is these SBCs, what someone else talked about. The co-working spaces, there's entrepreneurship centers and colleges and communities now. But by then they got a little better idea. They're, they're kind of focused. They're, they're getting something that works. They know how to steer this boat now. They can they have a place they want to go to in their head. And they're running a stuff as kind of a person. These are one person boats. So these are um, folks that get this thing started. They're the reason that these companies get to where they are because someone took a chance. And as you really give them the coaching and skills they need, you can see here, they're actually much more refined. They're going in, in a, where they're supposed to go. They have competition identified. They're trying to figure out where the best win, the best market is, the best way to become the leader in a certain field to pop out of this pack of, of things that happen. Um, but they're all much better. There's usually one or two people now in the thing. They might have someone that's invested a little bit and maybe had to go borrow some money to build to get the bigger boat, if you will. And then they grow and they start having to do different things. This is what I call going into from first stage to second stage. Uh, a new sets of skills have to be available for entrepreneurs. They get to the nine, 10 um, employee range and up in here up to 50. But this different set of skills, now you have to learn to delegate. You have to hire the right people. You have to have a, a better understanding of how these things all work together. And the competition's um, been thinned out some, but you still have significant competitions. So how do you to how do you uh, win in your particular market? How do you get to this this notion here that uh, again the owner may not even be on this boat anymore, right? The, the entrepreneur may have left, but he's still driving academic and more strategic decisions now. But these hired a good crew. They're all well trained. They know where this boat is going. They know where their competitions are. They know what they don't know. And you know, the 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 money they need make for venture capital to build even a bigger and better boat or a second boat as they franchise these out becomes different. How to how to create market now? How to, how to learn this stuff? How do you train your CEOs to become the best CEOs they can? All these kind of sessions need to take place in your communities and uh, locally and regionally to really help them thrive and be successful in your communities. And with that, I will leave time now for questions for any of the three speakers we just had, and I hope you have some. How is everybody? Does anybody have any questions? We're right at um, noon now. Okay. Thank you for the thank you for the chat. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Thank you. Great presentation. I'm going to be following up. I have I have some ideas. I'd love to have you come and share over here. So. Okay. Good. <laughs> So we have our next session beginning, um, and I think, thanks again, Tom, we, you actually got us a, finished one minute ahead of schedule. This is great. So I started this at the last hour, 10 minutes behind schedule. So um, I wanted to introduce our first speaker of the hour, uh, Dr. Zaid. Is that correct? Uh, Professor Dan. Yes. I, I think uh, 